Kathy's guest today is a kindred spirit of sorts. Diana Kokoska has had an amazing career over the years and much of her success is due to thinking differently. As a real estate agent, she's helped over 4,000 people buy a home, sell a home, or invest in real estate. She then turned to coaching others, training them to think differently in the sphere of real estate. As CEO of Keller Williams Realty International Maps, coaching and training for over 14 years, Diana played a pivotal role in catapulting the company to unprecedented heights, transforming it into the largest and most profitable coaching enterprise in real estate. Like Kathy, Diana is a certified John Maxwell coach. Enjoy this discussion on ways to add value and think differently. I'm very excited to welcome my friend Diana. So little little backstory here. Diana, I think the first time you and I talked, we realized we were in Papua New Guinea together. And I recognized you, right? But we just didn't get to know each other when we were in Papua New Guinea. And it was our mutual friend, Antoinette, who connected us recently. She actually read your book and said, oh my gosh, Kathy, you've got you've got to connect with Diana and you have to read her book because you guys have like minds. And we do. I love, I love the more we <laughs> talk to each other, we're more like, oh yeah, that I've, I've done that too. Or that's how I think too. So, yeah. so thank you, Diana, for leaning into your, your mindset of, of our thoughts and the power behind how we think. Well, thank you for this great opportunity. I love sharing and helping people. Oh, good, good. Because that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to yeah. challenge people to think differently and we're going to help them maybe sort some things out. But before we get started, I have a very important question because it is something I talk about quite a bit. And that is who is your favorite superhero? <laughs> I love that question because it actually started when my grandmother was reading a story and it was David Copperfield. And there was a portion in there that said, whether we decide to be the hero of our own life is yet to be told. Now I've got the, not the exact words yet. That's what I heard in my mind. And I went, hero of my own life? The heroes I knew were heroes for everybody else. Now I'm supposed to be the hero of my life. Well, if I'm gonna be a hero, who am I gonna be? And of course I wanted to be a woman and because Diana was Wonder Woman's name, and my name is Diana, it just made sense. I loved her lasso of truth. I loved that she stood for people's greatness. I loved that she was willing to fight for people that couldn't fight for themselves. And I really took a lot of those qualities on. And I have a saying, I will stand for people's greatness more than they will stand for their limitations. Mm -hmm. Because people love to hold on to those limitations. You being a coach, Kathy, you already know that, that by asking the right question, we can get them to think differently and go in a direction that allows that greatness to show, allows their strengths to come out and allows them to become the very, very best version of themselves, which is what a coach always wants to do. Oh, yes. My my heart is like beating faster because I'm just, I'm just getting more and more passionate. I love what you're saying. You already said something that made me think differently. That's superheroes are heroes for other people. But David Copperfield encouraged you to be a hero of yourself. I never thought of that before. I never thought of superheroes always being the hero for others. And we need to own our own success. We need to own it right here and be our own superhero. That is, we could stop right now. And I've got such a powerful learning lesson. <laughs> well, the greatest part about it to me is all of us have a story, right? And in every story, there's a victim, there's a villain, and there's a hero. I mean, look at every movie that ever came out. I mean, Disney has capitalized on that, right? And so when we tell our story and we're writing our own story, too many people have given the pen to somebody else and allowed them to write the story of their life. Yet when we take the pen in our hand and we start designing our life instead of living a life by default, well, we get to choose. Are we going to be the villain? Are we going to be the victim? Or are we going to be the hero? And it's all in how we think. We're either limiting ourselves or we're liberating ourselves. Yes, absolutely. So Diana, what's your story? 
Well, my story is uh, quite fun because I grew up working. In fact, at five years old, I worked in our grocery store, family-owned grocery store in a very small town called Vernal, Utah. It was very small at the time. It has since grown, obviously. Yet, I was over the magazine rack. And if a gentleman came in and picked up a car magazine, I would look at the car. Every magazine that had a car on it, I was to grab those up and say, hey, if you want to buy that one, you might want to buy these too. And I was paid by the number of magazines that I sold, right? Plus a nickel an hour, which was really fun. And it got me into a, a thing to realize that you can sell, you can help people think differently, right? Just by putting things in front of them to, to look at. So that's how it started. At eight years old, I was the cash register. I actually had Kathy to get on a step stool to reach the cash register. <laughs> so as people would come through with their carts, if they had ice cream, yet they didn't have the topping or whipped cream, we were to say, well, oh, that ice cream, don't you want caramel or chocolate or whipped cream and cherries on it? And obviously we were always upselling. Well, I found out that was adding value to them, adding value to them to think in a way that they hadn't thought of. Oh, yeah, I should take caramel and chocolate and cherries and whipped cream to make it absolutely great for our family, right? Well, if you could add value that way, I realized that you could add value in other ways as well. And as time went on, obviously going to college, uh, I took physics and math and ended up selling real estate, go figure. <laughs> when I got into real estate though, I uh, it was a man's world. Mm. I actually couldn't afford to get into real estate, yet I had sold and put my way through college. So I figured I was a great salesperson. I may as well make some money, right? And I go to real estate school. How did I get there? PBS was having an auction one night. My child was sick. I couldn't sleep, so I turned on the television, and lo and behold, they were auctioning off a broker's class. I bid $50. Now, this was a $1,200 class, and I bid 50 bucks. That's all I could afford, and I thought, oh, I don't know if I'll get it or not. At least I took a chance. Well, because it was 2 o'clock in the morning, Kathy, nobody wanted to go to real estate <laughs> school other than me, so I won. Lo and behold, off I went to real estate school and passed the exam. Now I've got to find a place to work. And I naturally assumed I was so brilliant. I thought I had sold my way through college. I'm a great salesperson. Everybody's going to want to hire me. No. <laughs> the, the number one company in Denver, Colorado, Van Scock, I went to, and they wouldn't even interview me. They said, oh, we have Emma Curtis She's our, our woman, right, realtor. I went to Moore and Company. They had Marilyn Getch. I kept going until 12 offices later. I finally found somebody that would hire me, a woman, right? They already had one, yet I said, look, by the time I go home, I want to be selling real estate for somebody. And they said, okay. Sam Bright was the broker's name. And boy, at that moment, he had my loyalty. Next morning, I got up. I'm so excited I'm in real estate. And then I realized I can't afford a babysitter. What in the world am I going to do? So I look out and I see my little red wagon, a radio flyer. It was a good red wagon. Then I put my kids in it and started going door to door, talking to people about if they liked their home, if they were moving, I'd love to be the realtor of choice. Make a long story short, I sold 104 homes my first year. Average agent was selling five. And people said, how did you do it? Well, see, first of all, nobody ever told me you couldn't sell that many homes. So the negativity wasn't put in my mind to think in those terms. Secondly, I did what I thought salespeople did, lead generate. And then you convert the leads and you follow up on the leads until you convert them. And so to me, it was just a natural thing. And I found that other people's kids wanted to play with my kids, which built the relationship even stronger. It was so much fun. It was thinking differently, though, that really hit the story. And I want people to think, how could you take something from another industry and put it into your industry? 
See, Tupperware parties were really big back then in the day. And I thought to myself, wow, how, they're having all these Tupperware parties. I'm getting in, invited to them. And what could I do? Well, I could have an investment party. So I started teaching how to invest in real estate, how to pay off your mortgage faster than paying all that interest up front, right? Paying on the principal amount. And teaching these kind of concepts, only bringing them together, having dessert with the husband and wife, and all the kids got together. So once again, I had a babysitter. It was fabulous. Think about your statement, think differently. That's what your tagline is. And I really want to have the listeners, what could I be doing that's out there that if I did in my business would dramatically change my business? Now I want to fast forward again. Selling real estate, got into training, speaking, opened up my own offices, had four of them going in Denver at the time. And we'll stop there and, and we'll go on a little bit later. So I don't take all time on my story. Oh, I love it. I love stories. I love your story. But yeah, let's back up a little bit because let's go back to five-year-old Diana. First of all, your parents were a genius putting a five-year-old out on the floor. Who's going to say no to cute little Diana offering another car magazine, right? <laughs> My, my parents were very, very smart. That's true. <laughs> but then, but then also, so, you know, when you're talking about being a cashier and, and somebody comes with ice cream, but no toppings. Yeah, we know that's called upselling. And many times I say myself, I don't want to be sold. But what you said was you're adding value to people. There's a difference. And, and to just look at that experience differently, they could come through the line and be like, girl, I'm just buying ice cream. Leave me alone. If I wanted the rest, I would have put it on the conveyor belt. Or they can come through the line saying, wow, thank you. I totally forgot to get the toppings. The yeah, or the way we were taught to say it is, oh, you have ice cream. I bet your family would love to have caramel or chocolate on that. So it wasn't really upselling. It was allowing them to realize that they could then be the hero of their family. I mean, all these little things that you look back on that you go, wow, that was brilliant the way that they had us do that. And you did have exact words that you were to use. We were using my pleasure way back then instead of no problem, right? All these things. We didn't have conveyor belts. We had the adding machine. And the, the most fun I ever had was the watermelon. You had to pick up and put it on the big scale. Oh. And of course, the scale would come down and at watermelons at three cents a pound, you had to figure out if it was three quarters of a pound or what, what are you going to charge, right? And so everybody with me being eight years old always wanted to see the calculations. I had to rip off that old tape from that machine and show them that the calculation was correct. So it taught me to not be upset when people really desired or questioned your way of thinking, wow. because there were times I did it in my head without the calculator. That's when they really wanted to see that calculation done. And uh, anyway, I trust people are getting a little bit out of this, mostly is what could you be doing today in your business to oh add God. value to other people that maybe you are looking at it like, oh, I don't want to bother them. Nobody likes to be sold, yet everybody loves to buy. And I think that's the phrase that I'd love to get across to people is allow people to buy and don't take it as rejection. If they say, no, I don't want chocolate or caramel topping. Go, okay, great. <laughs> it's okay. Don't take it personal. The word no never hurt anybody. We just hurt ourselves because of the way we think about the word, right? That's right. That's right. Have you had a defining moment in your life? Oh my goodness, Kathy, lots of them, yet one of them for people to learn about. And it's almost embarrassing to talk about because I did very, very well in real estate. In fact, having four offices, um, I was with a franchise at the time. We were number one, two, three, and four. I mean, we were knocking things out of the park. <laughs> and uh, 
uh, interesting enough, I had decided to start a property management division. Now, property management is very good because it's a steady income, whereas real estate is up and down, right? You can go from the heights of glory to the depths of depression all in the same 24 hours and sometimes five minutes. Well, I'm sitting there. I have 72 houses we're taking care of. And I have a friend that I put over those houses. She did everything with property management. And I'm going my own way. I wasn't watching my money. And I really want our listeners to hear this. I visit my money every week now. Mm. Because we need to know where we're at with our money, respecting our money, being great stewards of our money. I was not. I was making plenty of money. I was the only one driving. I was a single parent at the time and I had four cars. Okay, does that tell you? I love cars. And so all these things happening, I took my my eyes off the money. You can call it uh, hubris, born of success. You can say whatever you desire. I say stupidity. And yet at the time I was living the life. My kids and I were having a great time. Until my accountant came back from England, he'd been on a three month mission trip. I'm not watching the money. He's not watching the money. Well, you hear what's coming up. I woke up one morning to a phone call from him and he says, we've got to get together. I said, you sound terrible. What's going on? And he said, you're out of money. I go, oh no, I can't be out of money. We're doing so well. And he goes, no, Diana, you're out of money. Well, dropped the kids off at school, went straight to the office. We reconstructed everything. And I found out that all the rent checks had not gone into my bank account. They'd gone into hers. That all the mortgage checks that I'd written out and signed were never sent. They were thrown in the trash can. It was a time where if you just paid a little bit, mortgage people were not foreclosing because there were so many foreclosures going on. And she was sending in late pay. So that little $10, $15, $20, they weren't foreclosing until three months. Now foreclosure starts happening. Sellers are calling. Things are going crazy. And I have 72 houses to make up three house payments on each plus make my own house payment. I mean, obviously I sold the, the businesses, I sold my cars, I did everything. I sold the rentals I had, everything except for my house. I learned how to become a great negotiator. I paid everybody off. I did not pay the full amount to the banks because I negotiated with them. I did pay the full amount that was owed to every single seller and I learned a lot. I learned that your character is built based on how you handle things that go bad. I learned that taking full responsibility and owning up to the fact that I it was my fault because I wasn't watching the money. I also learned that it hurts to hurt people. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't mean to, I've never apologized so much in my life. And now, Selling everything, I went back to sales, which I knew very, very well. It was a great defining moment. Going back into sales, I had, I believe, a little bit more compassion, a lot more humility. <laughs> and the other part is um, I had to hustle because I had a lot of bills to pay off. I was at a business meeting. I was sat on the board of directors for the realtors, and I had people ride with me that night. Well, when we came out, I didn't have a car. It had been repossessed. And so everybody on the board heard, your car wasn't stolen, it was repossessed. So now I have not only that, I had to make certain that shame, anxiety, grief, all those things, that and depression, because I had two kids to take care of. So I do know that our thoughts matter. Our thoughts matter so much, especially about ourselves. In my book, I talk about the storytellers in our mind. There's four of them. And the devious storyteller played havoc. It played such havoc with me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night telling myself how stupid I was, how crazy it was. Why did I do that? Beating myself up mercifully. And then realizing once again I've got to be the hero to my own life. These kids are counting on me. 
I love Wendy's <laughs> hamburgers, only not their hamburgers. They saved me because they used to put out crackers for their chili. You know, you just went and got crackers. So I'd go in and I'd say, do you mind if I get some of those crackers? And they'd say, oh, no, you can have all you want. I'd put them in my purse, Kathy. That was my lunch many days, just the crackers. And I felt so bad because I felt like I was stealing from them. Only I did ask. <laughs> yeah. I think now that's why they only put two crackers in every bowl of chili that they send out. They don't have the crackers out in the open anymore. And I'm going, oh my goodness, did I pause that? Now that's some fun we can have with it. Yet, I trust everybody will hear this. Visit your money. Know where you're at. Read about not getting rich. Read about getting wealthy. Dave Ramsey's baby steps help out a lot. We didn't have those back in my day, yet I certainly am teaching those to many. Dell Alexander has a book out about living on 70% of what you make. And I just, all these little things that we can learn about money because our thoughts and the psychology around money is so important. And we got to learn to think differently about money to attract it into our lives because it's an energy and you're either attracting it or you're repelling it. Yeah, money is a lot like religion and politics. It's always one of the topics we don't talk about. <laughs> but, and it's like oxygen. You need it to live, right? <laughs> we do. We do. What I what I love, though, I, I am sorry that you, you had to experience that. But we all know we learn from the, our challenges, right? And what, right. what I heard you say is you went back to what you knew well. You knew sales. Yeah. And, and I've used that a lot. We we recently have moved to central Wisconsin. I lived in Iowa for over 30 years and, and was, you know, I am, I'm a successful person, right? And I had a direct selling business and I had my corporate jobs and, and now I've got my own business, but we also failed at a, a business. We've also had many failures. We've had had multiple jobs to make ends meet. So there, you know, there's, there's vast stories right there. But one thing that I've had to remind myself is I've done it successfully before. I'm yeah. going to climb out of whatever rut I'm in because I, I did it before. I've got that mindset or I've got those thoughts or I, I know those people to reconnect with. Yeah. What, what other strengths do we have within ourselves that we may have graduated past it, but we still have to depend on it. We have it's so to important that we go back to our strengths we have to know our strengths. We also have to know our weaknesses. Yeah. And a lot of people don't want to look at those. They don't want to talk about them. Everybody else sees them. So we may as well talk about them, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so you're an author. How many books have you written total? Well, actually, I've written a lot of workbooks and a lot of training courses. This is the actual first book that I've written. And of course, John Maxwell doing the foreword did, helped out a lot. I know. It's interesting to be an author, though. You're authoring a book, you know. It does make you think. And I'm finding all these people that want to write a book. And I go, well, when you get into it, you're going to find it a little different because you have to find the research to back up what you're saying. They don't just let you do that unless you self-publish. Then you can say whatever you desire to say. Yet I, I found that part very interesting with them saying, where did this come from? What was the research on it? Where did you find it? And so the book is full of research. Each and every part of our brain allows us to limit ourselves or liberate ourselves. Oh. And so every chapter gives the limiting portions on how we think and the liberating ways to change our thinking to help our story. So we live the story that we desire and have a legacy that we're proud to leave. Oh. I love that. I love that. I said it before. Your book is my, a precursor to mine. As I'm I'm listening to it, I'm like, I mean, there's many, many times, Diana, where I will stop. I might be halfway through a three mile walk and I will stop halfway. Like I'll pause my recording and be like, I got to get home and write that down. That was a really good quote she just shared. <laughs> I'll, I'll be silent. I will not listen to anything for the last mile and a half because I don't want to move in the audible recording that I'm listening to. Uh, but I love, I love, you know, for this being your first full book, it's a, it's a good one. And I really appreciate where you're Thank going you. with, with all of the, the content. And even if you do self-publish, you still want to 
you want to cite things appropriately, right? We want to give accurate information. So, so has there been any, any learning lessons while you were authoring the book or even now that it's, you know, selling, what, what are some of your big learning lessons as an author? Well, I'm going to go back a little bit because being CEO of Keller Williams uh, Realty International over their coaching and training division, I learned a lot of things that eventually come out in the book, not about Keller Williams, not about me. It's about watching how people's brains actually work and how we can help them change their brain. I wrote a program called Bold, Business Objective, A Life by Design. Had over 200,000 people, not just realtors, go through it and received over 80,000 letters of how that course had changed their life and put them on a trajectory of more success. Well, the, they started sending things to me about, you changed my life. We all know that. They had to make the decision. I gave them the words and the environment. They did it. And yet they would end with, would you please write a book? And Kathy, I, I didn't want to. I just said, I don't need to author a book. There's plenty of authors out there, plenty of books. They don't need another one. And I was down on the dock. We live on Lake Travis and on the boat dock. And I was reading and a text came in. Thank you for changing my life. I have so much gratitude for you. I just had to share that. And by the way, when are you going to write that book? And I answered back, thank you so much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Never addressed about the book. Went back to the book I was reading and there was John F. Kennedy's quote. If not now, when? If not us who, right? And I went, uh, okay, I got it, dear Lord. I got it. I'm writing a book. And that's how it actually started. And wow desired so desperately to help people achieve their greatness and then of course that limitation started back in and I went if I take them from limitations to greatness it's got to go from limiting to liberating and I thought about how our brain actually makes up the story of our life and so I made a model I copied John Wooden's success triangle only it was my model everything in that triangle allows our brain and allows the people to understand how their brain works. Why do you get so emotional when you're triggered versus being so logical? Why do we do the things that we do? And how do we change it? If we have a scarcity mindset, for example, 150 mindsets is what I found as I read through neuroscience books, as I Googled things, as I was doing research and I went, 150, Carol Dweck wrote an entire book about growth versus fixed. And, and there's 150. So I started whittling those down. I started looking at like my mentor, John Maxwell and Patrick Lencioni and Don Yeager and Gary Keller and all these people. And I started going, how do they think? What shows up? Because mindset is in the unconscious mind. Attitude is in the conscious mind. And I narrowed it down to seven that I believe that limit us and seven that liberate us. And how do you change? If you have a scarcity mindset, how do you go into an abundant mindset? And how do you know? So there's an assessment that people can take that will give them a pie chart and a bar chart as to how much of each of these mindsets they're carrying in their unconscious mind and what they can do about it to change. For example, entitlement versus gra uh, gratitude. Do you have a grateful mindset or an entitlement mindset? To get more gratitude, which means you'll have more in your life, well, you just, I give them five to seven things that they can do to change the way their brain thinks. And they do them every day. And within a couple of months, man, they are changing to a grateful mindset. And I've seen it work over this last year with the research I've done and listening to what's happening with people. So I highly recommend everybody take the assessment, get the book and work through it to change their mindset. Yeah, uh, spoiler alert, it's not easy to change a mindset, yep. but we created that mindset somehow. Can't we create a new one? <laughs> yes, and isn't it fun? Because as you already know, a neuron 
our thought hits from one neuron, travels along an axon. Of course, there's synopsis and all that involved. Forget all that crazy stuff. Yet it hits another neuron. And that pathway, the more we have that thought, just like going across a patch of grass, the more you walk across that patch of grass, the more you're going to use that and the deeper the rut goes. Well, that's our brain. The more we have a thought, good or bad, it makes a rut in the brain. And neuroscience says nerve cells that fire together, wire together. And the greatest part about it is they also tell us that nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together, which means our brain is plastic. Mm-hmm. And that plasticity allows us to change the way we think for good and change who we're actually being and allows us to become the person we've always desired to be. And above anything, let's become more. Yes, absolutely. And that that's the whole goal of everything, right? And as I said, as CEO, I, I took a, a company that was literally losing a million dollars a year and built it to a $500 million company. And I built it by using this model that I didn't even know I had at the time. Mm-hmm. Yet going back through journals, going back and talking with the people, it was literally changing their thinking that allowed that company to change. Because I say your business will grow to the extent that you do. So what are you doing to grow yourself so you grow your company? If you're not growing, forget it. Your company's not going to grow either. That's a hard realization for people to even entertain that idea. You know, we can always see it in others a lot faster than we see it in ourselves. That's not easy. Yeah. Well, and they want to know what to do. Yeah. You know, I, I find that many people when I go out and speak about mindset and then I get into things that they can do, like if I'm in real real estate or speaking with mortgage people or business people, leaders, they still want to know what to do because that's the way the brain, it wants to get into action. But I can tell you what to do. If your mindset isn't correct, if you're not thinking correctly, it's not going to work for you anyway. So we've got to start with our thinking and then go to the do, because it's be, do, have, as I said earlier. Oh, you're speaking my language. I, I love, it. I could go on for hours talking to you, but you know, let's stay focused in. Let's I... stay focused. <laughs> yeah, and you do, you have so much more to your story. You have so much more to offer. How can people stay connected with you and learn more about all of all of the, the strengths and content that you offer? Well, Diana Kokoska is quite an interesting name because Diana is D-I-A-N-N-A and Kokoska, K-O-K-O-S-Z-K-A. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, They can go to becomingmorebook.com and learn all about the assessment and to get to know me. Just connect with me many ways. Right. There's so many ways on social media. We can Google you and we will find you, right? Yes, and LinkedIn, absolutely. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so as we as we come to a close, what is the last parting thought that you want to leave our listeners? To realize that you have greatness inside of you. And you have the four storytellers, the devious one that's going to beat you up, the flattering one that's going to make you think you already know and closes your mind to ideas and opportunities. The third one is the one that really is frightening. It's a reasonable. It's the one that gives you excuses, gives you reasons as to why things happen. It allows you to blame other people for everything that's happening in your life. And yet, once you take responsibility for everything, your life truly changes. The fourth storyteller is the one that I desire for you. It's the empowering storyteller where you not only empower yourself, you're able to empower other people for their greatness to show up. So one, we have to believe it. Then we can go and do whatever we desire to achieve by helping our thinking to be the way that we can do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Thank you for being empowering to me and to everybody else who's listening. Thank you for speaking these empowering ideas and helping us to think differently. I Well, it's been a pleasure and such a great opportunity. I just um, 
want to add value. That's basically a story of my life. Make a difference and add value to others daily. Thank you. Well, for all the listeners, look in the show notes because we'll have all kinds of links to different websites and books that are, you know, the book that, that Diana wrote. So you can be clicking on that to stay connected. So thank you. And, and you know, look forward to, to more conversations in the future, more growth and more synergy as we continue to, to bind together in our thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.